Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Every Citizen Perspectives on Lowering the Voting Age to 16. Uh, my name is Sharif Mahdi, and I work with the Students Commission of Canada, an organization that purposely works to ensure young people's voices are heard and valued. Before we get right into it, it's really important that everybody uh, click on the globe feature on your Zoom and pick a language that you'd like to uh, like to be participate in. This will be offered in English and French. So it's very important that you pick that before we get right into this because then you'll be able to hear uh, in the language of your choice. So I'll just give you folks a few seconds to find that. It's right beside, uh, it's, it's right at the bottom of your screen and there should be a globe that has the option to say uh, English or French. So I'll give you folks uh, that uh, in the next few minutes to uh, get that sorted. Alrighty, now that you've probably hopefully picked uh, the language of your choice, uh, I'd like to also start off by acknowledging that we are in the northern, this, this conversation is about the northern half of Turtle Island, which is governed by a number of treaties with Indigenous peoples. Uh, we're probably coming in from a, a, across the country, coast to coast to coast, so there isn't a specific a treaty that I'm going to reference today, but I want to make sure that we ground ourselves in remembering that we are on territories that have been uh, lived on by Indigenous peoples for thousands of years and that this territory, the territory of what's now known as Canada, uh, is governed by a number of Indigenous treaties uh, with the Crown. So we will start by acknowledging uh, the very important um, contributions and the partnership that we all have to make towards contributing to truth and reconciliation in this country. And that truth starts with acknowledging the territory that we're on and that it's governed by a number of different treaties. I also want to uh, you know, acknowledge that this is a particularly challenging time in our society. We're, uh, you know, we're living through a pandemic, which is already a big stressor. We're living through a reckoning in terms of racial justice and equality, and that this can be very uh, exhausting and challenging for a number of us, especially for those of us who live this every day. So I wanna make sure that we acknowledge that we're coming to this webinar today, uh, living through a very fraught and challenging time and for us to remember to be kind to one another. Um, we're all, um, we, we're, we're trying to maintain two meters, we're trying to be physically distant, uh, we're trying to do so safely in the midst of a pandemic and a, and a reckoning in terms of racial justice. So let's be really kind to one another and to ourselves. Um, if, you know, if we're not firing on all cylinders today, uh, there's a big reason why that's happening. So let's just make sure that we ground the conversation in knowing where we're situated right now as a society. And with that being said, we wanna make sure that the conversation today is grounded in respect. Respect for one another, respect for the fact that we may hear differing viewpoints on this matter, but we're going to ensure that we disagree without being disagreeable. We're gonna ask you to be respectful in terms of the panelists who are here today, we're gonna ask you to listen deeply to what they have to say so that you can really understand a perspective that may be very different from yourselves or that may reinforce a perspective that you already have. With those kind of three, three uh, pillars in place, respect, listen and understand, then we can communicate the change we wanna see. And you know, we're really kind of interested in seeing how we can mobilize to think through how we lower the voting age. So we're going to be moderating conversations today to ensure that we keep grounded in that uh, first pillar of respect and uh, that's how we're hoping that this session can run today. So I'm going to now just share a little bit about the technical aspects of how today are going to go. Um, we are making sure we, we've disabled the Zoom's Q&A function. Uh, all comments can be sent to the moderators via the chat and they will, uh, the moderators of the panels that will be going, uh, that will be happening today will be um, sharing uh, the questions um, as quickly as they can with the time that there is allotted. We'll be sharing the questions with uh, the panelists um, so you can send your questions in, um, can be sent to the moderators directly 
Um, and you know, on that on that uh, theme of respect, we want to ensure that the comments and questions are respectful. Uh, so we cannot, you know, if a question is not respectful, then it won't be won't be asked. Um, but we're going to make sure that uh, that those questions are moderated so that they can hopefully all get answered uh, with the panelists today. We have three panels, as you can see on the slide here. One will be chatting about legal foundations. The second will be about political opportunities. And the third panel will be on youth perspectives. Uh, we're also offering an opportunity for anyone on this webinar who is under the age of 20 to meet with us after at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So about half an hour after this webinar to talk about how we might pursue some advocacy for lowering the voting age. We'll share the meeting ID uh, information with you at the end of the webinar, which you can see now on this on this slide. So now I'm going to uh, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Cheryl Milne and Mary Birdsell, who uh, will start off and kick off our first panel. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, today's webinar. I'm Cheryl Milne. I'm a lawyer and I'm the executive director of the David Asper Center for Constitutional Rights, which is part of the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. And I'm Mary Birdsell and I'm a lawyer and I'm the executive director of a legal clinic in Ontario called Justice for Children and Youth. Uh, so we are a legal clinic that offers legal services to young people across an array of legal issues and seeks to advance um, and protect the rights and dignity of young people in Ontario and in Canada. Um, so I wanted to kick off just for a quick moment before Cheryl tells us some of the important uh, substance of what we wanna say about, about the legal framework um, when we think about the voting age, um, to just talk a little bit about what the foundation of our thinking is about what voting is all about. So, Voting is a fundamental aspect of a democracy. So when we think about democracy, what we're looking for is a fair way to select people who will make decisions for all of us. And so voting is one of the most important and basic ways of participating in that kind of a democracy. Um, it's a starting point where we are allowed to then to contribute to the choice of people who will make decisions for all of us, including making laws for all of us. One of the things about voting is that we consider it to be a human right, not something that is a privilege or that has to be earned, but something that um, people are entitled to within the democracy. So it's not like being allowed to use the computer or allowed to stay up late or even allowed to drive a car. It's more like um, having food or being safe um, in your home and in your community. So we don't have to earn the right to vote. We don't have to pass a test that you're ready to vote. All citizens are allowed to vote, um, partly because they have other responsibilities like obeying the law and paying taxes. And so they should be allowed to participate in choosing who gets to make those rules. So when we talk about voting, we wanna make sure that we include all the citizens um, on the list of people who are allowed to vote. And this kind of question and looking at what the right list of people is has happened before um, throughout history um, in, in democracies all over the world. And so including in Canada, many of you uh, we may know that we've had uh, movements where we're talking about whether women should be allowed to vote, um, whether indigenous people should be allowed to vote and racialized people and people of color as well as whether people who are in jail for having uh, violated the criminal law and um, whether people who are Canadian citizens but they live in another country. All those things have happened in the distant past and in the more recent past. So now we're saying it's time to think about age and whether the limitation of needing to be 18 years old in order to vote is the right thing to do. Um, so the last thing I wanna say before I turn it over to Cheryl is that when people talk about the vote or the right to vote, the other words that they sometimes use are um, the vote or franchise or the franchise. So having the franchise is being allowed to vote. Um, and more historically, more than recently, people also talk about suffrage. So the suffrage movements are about um, trying to make space for people to vote who haven't previously been allowed to vote. So Cheryl, over to you. Okay. In Canada, uh, our voting age and voting rights 
tend to be governed by, le by legislation. So uh, the Canada Election to Elections Act governs who can vote in the federal elections across the country, and each province has their own Elections Act as to who can vote in both provincial and municipal elections. But in addition to that, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms says that every citizen has a right to vote in Canada for both um, the federal government and the provincial governments, and that's section three of the Charter. We also, the other part of the Charter that's relevant um, for our discussion today is section 15, which says that everybody is equal uh, under the law and cannot be discriminated against on the basis of age, one of the, the listed um, grounds under that section. So really the only qualification that we have for voting at the moment um, is citizenship, except there are qualifications, um, particularly with age in the pieces of legislation that govern it. So the, the Supreme Court of Canada, who is the final word on how you interpret the charter in this country, says that for a government to limit this right, they need to have strong evidence to base a justification for that limit. So we are, all our, our rights under the charter do have some limitations, but the government has to prove based on evidence why they need to limit it. And that's why they're in a most recent decision the um, um, people living outside of the country, um, if they lived outside of the country for more than five years, it used to be they couldn't vote. But that was overturned as being unconstitutional because the government could not really justify why those people would be disenfranchised or the vote taken away. Um, the, in the past, also, the courts have allowed government leeway when it comes to age limits. Um, and uh, mostly for administrative reasons. So you, sometimes you just have to have an age cutoff for things. Sometimes the age cutoffs make sense. Um, so there is some room for that, although we would argue, um, and at least I would argue, that because Section 3 of the Charter says it's only citizens, and because the Supreme Court has said you have to be really clear if you're going to um, take away the vote from somebody, that um, you, the government has to do more than just say, administratively, it's easier for us to have the age cutoff of 18. So we also know that, um, so the, the kinds of arguments that come up in a, in a challenge that would be based on the charter, and one of the things that we're talking about is doing an actual challenge to the Canada Elections Act. Some of the arguments are that um, young people don't have the capacity to make a decision, and so 18 is the, the, the age they've chosen. But what we now know is that decision-making capacity for this type of decision, which is a reasoned decision, people have time to think about it, um, you can in, um, educate yourself. It really comes into so the adult level for people in their early teen years. So certainly by ages 14, 15, young people are as capable as adults of making reasoned decisions. And that's what we know about the social science and the neuroscience. It's also, so that's one thing is the capacity issue. Others would say, well, what about democracy and we need to have some kind of order and you know, what would happen if all these young people vote? It's really, um, this kind of limit is also going, is, it's getting more or less and less supported by the international evidence. We do have examples from many countries around the world that have lowered the voting age, mostly to 16. And the, and the results have been, neutral, like the sky hasn't fallen, or in some cases really positive results, such as more civic engagement for young people well into their 20s, um, which is an, era, it's an age when a lot of people don't vote, but those who have been given the, the vote at a younger age tend to vote more in, into their, their 20s. Um, so, the, so there are some really good reasons and arguments that the government would have a hard time trying to counter to justify that, that uh, limit. I'm going to turn it over to Mary to talk about age-based milestones a little bit and what it means to challenge this in a court case and then um, open it up for, for questions. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about something that Cheryl's mentioned, which is that sometimes we put age limits or we uh, create rights and responsibilities under the law 
and we include age as some part of that. Um, so for instance, driving is a really obvious one that teenagers often think about. Um, in Canada, in all provinces and territories, uh, you can drive when you turn 16. Um, and driving is an interesting thing I'm gonna come back to. But school is another example. And school is an example of something that has both a right and an obligation attached to it. So you have not just, you, you have to go to school, there is an obligation, but also you have a right to go to school. The government and the, the system has to allow you to go to school in Canada. Um, and usually the ages for that are that you have to start going to school at age four or five or six, and you have to go to school until you're 18 in most provinces and territories. Another example is getting help from the Children's Aid Society. Um, most province, well, all provinces and territories have a law about children getting help to protect them from harm and danger. And um, usually children can get help up to the age of 16 or 17, 18, and some provinces even 19. Um, another example of an age-based law is your ability to consent to participating in sexual activity. And so we see children as needing different kinds of protections where we say, you know what, you're just not old enough to be consenting to sexual activity. But we have laws where 12 and 13 year olds are old enough, 14 and 15 year olds. And then after the age of 16, we have um, the ability to consent to sexual activity with anybody except a person in position of power. Um, the other example that I just wanna reference quickly is the criminal law. Um, everybody is actually obliged to abide by the criminal law, even small children. But up until age 12, we don't use the criminal justice system to, to sort of uh, uh, impose punishments or consequences for breaking the criminal law. But once you turn 12 years old, you are responsible and seen to be accountable and uh, to be brought before the criminal justice system if you contravene the law or break the law. Um, and then once you turn 18, you are dealt with in the adult criminal system from 12 to 17, you're dealt with in the youth criminal justice system, but it's still a form of accountability under the law. Um, and then of course, the one that we've, we've both uh, mentioned briefly is that if you work and earn money, then you are obligated to pay taxes. And one of the really, um, big things that people have talked about over this, the decades and centuries is that if you pay taxes into the government and the government gets to decide how to spend that money for our benefit, our collective benefit, then you should be allowed to vote and participate in um, who has selecting. So we see that many, many teenagers are participating in public life, for instance, by buying taxes or paying taxes, pardon me, um, and also by participating with political parties, and all of the four major political parties in Canada allow people uh, 14 and over to vote within the party structure. So for instance, you may know that the Conservative Party of Canada just had a, a, a convention um, where they chose a new leader and people as young as 14 were allowed to vote for which leader they thought would be the appropriate one to lead. Um, just referencing back to something I said before, and then Cheryl talked a lot about more about it, is that we sort of think of voting as more akin to a human right than to a privilege like driving. Um, and discrimination is a, a law that applies to everybody broadly. You aren't allowed to discriminate against people, uh, regardless of age most of the time. So usually, as Cheryl said, age-based laws are put in place uh, for a sort of a reason, but often we say it's a proxy for something else. So when we say it's a proxy, we mean we put in an age because it's too hard to figure out some other way of making a cutoff. Um, so driving that I mentioned, there's a mixture of an age and a test. You know, you have to be either 14 or 15 or 16, and then you have to take a test and then you get a license and you can drive. The criminal law, there's no test. Once you turn 12, you are subject to uh, being charged by the criminal law. And taxes, again, no age. So as Cheryl sort of described, we've, the government and, and in Canada has chosen 18 as an age below which you are just not allowed to vote. And keeping in mind, there's no test once you turn 18. You just are allowed to vote. So this question about capacity that Cheryl's talking about is really important because why do you pick an age if it's not related to some other pieces of, of something that you're looking at? So 
governments are responsible for changing laws most of the time, all of the time. Um, but the other thing you can do is go to a court and ask the court to decide whether the law is correct or fair or whether it abides by the charter, which is um, the most important law in the country. So one of the things that we are thinking about doing with respect to this um, question of voting age is going to the court and saying that we think, as Cheryl has described, that the law violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and that it should be lowered. Um, so how do you go to court? Well, there are a bunch of different ways that you can do that. Individual people can hire a lawyer and go to a court to say something is unfair. And organizations um, like the Asper Center, like Justice for Children and Youth, like many of the other organizations who are here today, can also go to the court. And in this case, what we're thinking about, we know that there are young people who are interested in this question and might want to go to the court as individuals. And it might also be very helpful if those individuals worked with um, Justice for Children and Youth uh, and the Asper Center and others uh, to bring the question to the court. So just the, the organization would ask the court and the individuals all together would ask the court. Um, so we wanted to lay out some of this information to you and um, invite you to consider participating in, the, in advocacy around um, changing the law um, in any way that interests you, including possibly being involved in the litigation somehow. Uh, so we wanted to uh, make sure we had time to answer people's questions. Um, yeah, we don't, I've noticed that we don't have any um, questions in the chat and I want to encourage people that as the panel, panelists throughout are talking, feel free to, to put questions into the chat because we are monitoring it and we'll bring them up as they come along and we'll um, answer them at the end. Um, but we have a few minutes now before the next panel for questions. If anyone has any questions about the law and how you challenge the law and, um, you know, what the legal arguments are. And I don't see it. If there's any, if, it, if people are having difficulty with the chat, if for some reason it's not working, um, I think you may have, have Tal Schreier's email address in, in um, the notices that uh, have been sent around and you might want to give her a, um, uh, a quick note. Um, so, you're up, um, so the th one of the questions is, we did get a question, <laughs> um, is, and that there's actually two questions and they're kind of related. What are some of the major legal arguments you're up against in lowering the, the legal voting age? And what do you expect the government position will be? And so I um, started, and I'll just start, and Mary can jump in, but I started to um, address that a little bit when I said that you know, governments have been given a lot of leeway when it comes to arbitrary sort of age cutoffs because it, it's, um, they call it an administrative expediency. It's easier. Um, it's easier to have a clear cut rule rather than have somebody have to take a competency test, for example, before they could vote. Uh, I think many people sometimes argue that all people should have a competency vote or a test before they vote, but we don't expect that. In, in Canada, it's not a requirement. Um, and so uh, that's one of the arguments is going to be that this is just easier government gets to choose and um, you need to give government some kind of, of um, discretion to make that decision. And in fact, the Supreme Court in sort of in one of their judgments regarding prison rights made an offhand comment like age seemed to be like a logical thing where you could cut um, cut off voting. But uh, as, as I said, we're trying to counter that with, with the arguments around competency and around what's happening around the world. Another question, uh, um, Mary, maybe you can, um, uh, is, it, is there a similarity um, between making decisions about voting and making decisions about your health? Yeah, so that's a great question and something we that will come up probably in the legal case. Um, the question about whether how, what age are you old enough to make decisions about your health um, differs from province to province. But one of the underlying things there is that, in, especially in Ontario, but in other provinces as well, um, it's not a question of age. It's actually a question of capacity. So in that context, there's not a test that you have to take, but the healthcare provider has to make a decision about whether you really understand what's happening. Um, 
and that's why sort of the social science is interesting in the in the the voting context. Um, and I I do think there is some similarity between the kind of decision that some people would call. Um, uh, a, the, there's one of the things in the literature they use a difference between a cold decision and a warm decision, and and basically the the quick decision that you have to make instantaneously where there's some you know really fast. Uh, not a chance to deliberate, not a chance to be educated. Those kinds of decisions are made um, in a more complex way in the brain uh, or a, a more, uh, in a way that involves parts of the brain that develop later into adulthood. Um, but these kinds of decision in voting where you have time to think about it, you gather information, you talk to other people, um, are the kinds of decisions that um, children as young as 12 have fairly developed parts of their brain to do that. Um, so I think that the, the similarity between um, being able to make important healthcare decisions at an age much below 18 will come up. Um, so an, another question is, has the law changed in other jurisdictions other places, yeah. um, to permit a lowing vo voting age? And I, um, I, I want to um, acknowledge that we do have a panelist in the next panel from, from Wales who will talk about um, what they've done to lower the voting age there. And she's also going to speak to what happened in Scotland. So Scotland did lower the voting age um, for their referendum a few years ago and have kept that age at 16 for um, their parliament. There also is a lower voting age in countries like Austria. Um, it's been 16 in Austria for quite some time. And so there are examples around the world, and there are a few others, um, where the voting age has been reduced. Um, to at least 16, and then there, may, there are a couple of countries, I think, where it's even 14. Um, so yes, there is precedent for it. Canada would not be the first country to do this. Um, another question is, has this case ever been brought to the courts before? And the answer is kind of yes. Um, <laughs> and I say kind of because it hasn't gone all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. There was a case that was argued in Alberta a number of years ago, um, more than 10 years ago now. Um, and it was two young people um, represented by a lawyer that brought an argument that the voting age should be reduced. In um, The focus was on the um, Alberta um, legislation, so it wasn't the Federal Elections Act. And the Alberta Court of Appeal said that the, the discrimination based on age was fine, and was not unconstitutional. So it's a bit of a hurdle that anyone has to get over if they're bringing a case now. I just think that, I mean, there's a couple of things that happened in that case. One was that absolutely no evidence was put forward to support lowering the voting age. And I don't think anybody that does constitutional litigation now would go forward with a case without evidence. Um, so it's, uh, and then that is precisely, you know, why I've been talking about what we know about the evidence about um, decision making as well as what's happening around the world. Um, there are a couple of other questions in the chat, but I'm going to um, just share my screen quickly, if that's okay with Cheryl. Yep. Um, because we do have a, um, uh, uh, um, sorry, now, um, this uh, document that we're going to send out um, to give you some information about if, if you were interested in advocating or um, being involved in litigation, um, this is a document that gives you some information about what it would mean to be a litigant and uh, what's involved in the litigation. Um, so, uh, the other question that came up was, uh, are there other ways? And yes, there are other ways than, than being a litigant. Um, and those include some of the things that people are going to talk about in the next panels and what we're going to talk about at three o'clock. So I'd encourage you to stay tuned. In the political arena, there are things you can do and in the local context. Um, maybe the other thing I'll say quickly is um, that if you were interested in talking to a lawyer, you can contact any of the organizations that are involved and we can, uh, you know, we're collectively working and we can, we can reach out and speak with you. Um, this document is going to get sent around to all the participants, so you'll be able to look at it after the, after the, um, after the event. Uh, so it's not a matter of you needing to go out and find a lawyer who'd be interested. The lawyers are here and we're already working on the case. So you'd be welcome to contact us if you wanted to. Um, so I just, there are just two um, additional questions. Um, and then we're going to go to the next panel, but I'll answer them quickly if Mary wants to add to it. One is how to reconcile voting at 16 
with the international definition of a child being under 18. Um, and I just want to say that um, the, one of the key things about children's voice under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is what is being referenced here, is that um, young people's voice is supposed to really be listened to in, based on their capacities and evolving capacities. So uh, having a vote at a younger age is not inconsistent with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, in my view, because I think that um, it is really consistent with respecting um, the right of children to be able to make decisions uh, uh, that are important to them and impact them, and that's Article 12. This, the second question is just about different pieces of legislation and if you could have the change happen at the provincial level but not the federal level. That's one of the things about provinces could actually change their own legislation and, and reduce the voting age um, in their own province, but it wouldn't apply in any other province and it wouldn't apply federally. And if the federal government changed the Canada um, Elections Act, it would only apply to federal um, elections and wouldn't apply to provincial ones. One of the benefits of doing a court challenge is you may have then a, a really clear legal opinion that if um, we are, um, if, if we're successful, that um, all those other laws that keep the voting age at a higher rate would actually be unconstitutional. And so it would make it easier to advocate and make the, the laws change um, across the country if you have, it, have a, a court decision on that, on that ground. So I, I'm gonna end it there because I, I know we, um, we, don't, we wanna try and keep to the time as much as we can, we're about three minutes over. Uh, and I want to turn, the uh, turn it over to our next moderator for the panel, Lisa Wolf from UNICEF Canada. And thank you very much, everyone thank for your you very comments. much. Hi everyone, thank you so much, uh, Cheryl and uh, Mary. I am Lisa Wolf, I'm the Director of Policy and Research at UNICEF Canada. Um, in addition to new legal perspectives on the voting age that were raised by Cheryl and Mary, the political landscape has been shifting as well. It's been 50 years since Canada last considered uh, the voting age and lowered it from 21 to 18. But more recently, during the last federal election in 2019, uh, two parties pledged to support lowering the voting age. And in the last parliament, Senator Mary Lou McFedrin introduced a bill in the Senate to amend the Elections Act to lower the voting age to 16. And as Cheryl described internationally, we've seen other jurisdictions find ways to include younger citizens. And so our panel is going to discuss uh, opportunities and challenges to secure a lower voting age through political advocacy and reform, which I think picks up on one of the questions in the chat that we haven't gotten to yet. So it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. Uh, and I'll uh, ask you to ensure you turn on your mics and video. Um, we have the Honorable Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, who is a lawyer and human rights advocate and represents Manitoba as an independent member of the Canadian Senate. She is a member of the Order of Canada and an expert in constitutional law and a lifelong advocate for the equality of women and the rights and well-being of young people. So we couldn't have a better uh, representative for, for this issue. Um, Mike Morden is the acting executive director at the Samara Centre, which is Canada's premier nonpartisan charity dedicated to strengthening Canada's democracy. He has a PhD in political science from the University of Toronto and has served as a research and policy advisor to governments, universities and think tanks. And we're so happy to have Maisie Evans here. Uh, Maisie is a secondary student from South Wales. So thank you, Maisie, from uh, across the water and late in the day for you. Um, Maisie feels very strongly about encouraging young people to become engaged in politics in line with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And her current academic interests include maths and sciences. And outside of school, she promotes youth voice through various platforms, as well as volunteering through St. John Ambulance. So wonderful to have you here. And I have some questions for the panelists, uh, and then we're gonna open it up to, uh, to chat questions. So Senator McFedrin, uh, earlier this year, you introduced a bill in the Senate that would amend the Elections Act to lower the voting age to 16. 
And unfortunately, that bill has died with the recent prorogation of Parliament. But could you tell us a bit about what inspired that bill and perhaps what your plans are for when Parliament resumes next month? Lisa, thanks for the question, and thank you so much for the chance to be here with you. Um, I have online as well some of the members of my Youth Advisory Council, and I can tell you that there is really one answer to your question about what inspired me, and that is my Youth Advisors. It's very clear to me, and it has been for some time before I came to the Senate, I was an educator as well as a lawyer, and it's been very clear to me for a long time that young people are hugely underestimated in our country on almost every level. And that assumptions and stereotypes that have been built in to, into people's thinking have really blocked the passageway for young people to fully realize their potential, their capacity to lead, not as leaders of tomorrow, leaders of today. And lowering the federal voting age to 16 was something that I could do as a senator. I could begin that process in the Senate. There are numerous times that there have been attempts to change the law in Canada to lower the voting age to 16, starting in the House of Commons. They've all failed, and there are some very practical reasons for that. It is a general uh, agreement, I think, so far in terms of the strategic discussions I've had with a whole range of people, that by starting this bill in the Senate, we may very well have a much better chance of actually bringing it into law. And so this combination of a solid political strategic opportunity, along with the very strong support and guidance and um, motivation and inspiration from the youth advisors that work with me is really what has culminated in this bill. And yes, at the very first possible opportunity, there will be another introduction of this bill in the second session of this parliament. Thanks, Senator McFedrin. So yes, we, um, you know, things have not been static uh, in, in this area, as you point out. And you know, Mike, I think that uh, we tend to think of the voting age as static. Again, it was last lowered um, 50 years ago. Uh, and there have been a lot of changes to rules around voting since then. Um, and we know that, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, there's been more inclusion or enfranchisement of, of uh, people over time. Um, women, Indigenous peoples, uh, expatriates, as in the recent case that, uh, that Mary mentioned, um, different groups of Canadians have been included over time. Are there any common threads in this history that might help us understand a tipping point for change of this type to include younger citizens? Uh, thanks, Lisa. It's a really, it's an interesting question. And when you present those different groups that have been uh, included in the Canadian electorate incrementally, you know, my first reaction is actually how different the story has been from group to group. And, and that in itself might be somewhat instructive, you know, with respect to, to women, I think, you know, at least the con conventional uh, story goes that there was decades of, of determined, uh, sustained campaigning on the part of women uh, for the franchise, um, you had success at the local level and then the provincial level. And then finally you had a big shock to the system, which was the first world war. And that was the first time women were able to, uh, to vote. And there were sort of um, reasons for that specific to the moment. Um, and, and I think sometimes that that's the way these things unfold. You sort of, you try to build from the ground up and wait for your moment. And then it can arrive because of some, you know, external shock, which suddenly, reduces the costs uh, of change and maybe makes it easier to persuade people who would otherwise be unpersuadable. And then once you've done it once, you, you have a new norm or you have a kind of proof of concept, you can say, look, th this works. I wonder if that maybe describes the experience uh, uh, in Scotland, but I'll, I'll, I will defer to my colleague Maisie um, from Great Britain on that front. And then you talk about the vote being extended to Indigenous people, and that's such a different story. You know, it, it wasn't until 1960 that status First Nations were able to vote in Canadian elections. Um, and uh, I've looked back at some of the, the, the correspondence between chiefs at the time and, and the office of the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Diefenbaker at the time, uh, and what you find is uh, 
chiefs sounding a note of surprise to discover that they can vote in Canadian elections and an ambivalence and even anxiety. And you know, what does this mean for our treaty relationships um, and for our special status uh, within Canadian law that flows from those treaties? So it wasn't really a, a social movement uh, breakthrough. It was more about a decision taken very, a decision very centered in Ottawa uh, and, and received um, with, with, uh, great ambivalence. Uh, enfranchisement means something very different in that context. It's just a few decades earlier, uh, Indigenous activists were actually threatened with enfranchisement uh, as a tool to sort of remove them from their communities and include them in, in the Canadian community uh, instead. Uh, so, you know, long story short, I think in some instances you see change from the bottom up and sort of um, percolating up through different level uh, orders of government and finally breaking through at the national level. In other cases, you really see decision makers um, at, a, at the elite level following their convictions and, and sometimes change comes that way too. I think you know, the advantage to trying to break through at, for, at, the, at the top is it, it can be a little bit, uh, it can be a little bit uh, quicker um, and you have fewer people to persuade. The disadvantage is sometimes you have legitimacy uh, challenges that will follow you. The advantage from the disadvantage from building from the bottom up is it takes time. You have to be prepared to count the small victories. Uh, but you you're also sort of bringing the public with you, and and, it, and there's a way to 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 kind of manufacture opportunities that might not otherwise exist by proving uh, incrementally that you're the, the, that the idea is uh, is sound. I see. I think you see both both dynamics reflected in in our history. Okay, thanks, Mike. So very different motivations and timescales. Um, well, timescale is something to think about. That's kind of sobering. And I think, you know, what you mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, a, a crisis or a grand world event motivating change is really interesting in the time of COVID and thinking about how young people have made so many sacrifices and will bear the shadow of COVID potentially the longest and that being a moment um, and I, I believe, Maisie, you'll have some uh, interesting insights to add to, to this question about a tipping point and how to get past that tipping point. Um, in Wales, uh, where you come from, you have lowered the voting age. So can you tell us a little bit about the factors that actually led to that? Um, definitely. I mean, in Wales, I'll admit it was a long and quite a tiring process, actually, to um, to give young people the right to vote. But I think it's worth it, definitely. We um, in Wales actually only gained the powers to pass that kind of legislation in 2017. So it's moved quite quickly, actually. Um, three years or so it came into effect in June this year and um, it was as a result of a lot of campaigns, a lot of reviews, a lot of reports but mainly young people like me um, speaking to the members of parliament, the senators as such um, and just ensuring that their voices were heard um, and being quite annoying actually I guess um, we as young people put a lot of pressure on our government to, um, to lower the voting age. Um, and we were very lucky, our, our parliament were, they were four votes of 16 um, all along, I'd say, most of them anyway. So we were very, very lucky that it didn't take too much persuasion. But that's not to say that a lot of research didn't happen and a lot of sort of engagement didn't happen in advance. Thanks, Maisie. Uh, I'd like to go back to Senator McFedrin because you've been hearing a lot from young people about um, there are opportunities to participate in Canada's political system and the voting age being a really powerful way that they're telling you uh, they want to be involved. Um, do you have any advice for the young people on the webinar today about how to work with the political system and what they can actually do, building on what Maisie said about what happened in Wales? I don't know so much about advice, Lisa, but I do want to issue an invitation here to any of the, actually anyone, but in particular to any of the young people that are, are here um, with us to consider contacting me, my office, it's on the website, just my name, um, because we have a whole youth advisory group across Canada, um, already quite diverse, and very committed to working with parliamentarians to make this change in our law. And I, I think this is very consistent what we've heard from you, Maisie. 
it's when young people themselves mobilize. And we're actually calling everyone who's working at the local level to bring this change into Canadian law a mobilizer. And it's an opportunity in high schools, in communities, uh, in families, in various organizations for mobilizers to really focus on the potential of the law and how relatively easy and straightforward this is as a piece of legislation. It's not a complicated law. And the value from the perspective of young people of what they can bring to revitalize Canada's democracy. I mean, if we think about it for a moment, the burden of what's happening right now in our pandemic, and I don't mean that, I don't mean what government has spent as, as being critical, I'm not. I'm very much reminded of after World War II, how we ended up with Medicare and think what our country would have been like without Medicare during this pandemic. And it happened at the initiative of one province and then it was picked up by Prime Minister uh, Pearson and it was turned into a national program with huge opposition. I actually don't think we would see that kind of opposition for lowering the voting age to 16 if anyone pays attention to the research. The evidence is really clear about the capacity of 16 to 18 year olds, not only to vote as well and as often and as thoughtfully as those who are 18 and over, but there's some pretty strong indication in the research that they might actually do it better that what we're seeing is that countries that have already lowered the voting age to 16 have actually seen a strong increase in first time voting. And some of the research we're seeing that there's a greater willingness in that age range of 16 to 18 to engage as citizens of Canada, but also as global citizens. To understand the bigger context, because this is much more the reality that 16 to 18 year olds live than for many in the, in the older generation. So nearly 60% of young people between 15 to 30 have answered in surveys that voting is what they see as one of the most effective ways to make a difference. So I really think in terms of advice, it's really not advice, it's really a request. Please, for those of you that are here or that can spread the word, get more engaged. We're more than happy to support you and there's a whole network of young people that are already out there ready to work with you. Thanks, Senator McFedrin. And I know the, uh, the next panel is going to be uh, providing a lot more dialogue among young people and um, opportunities to get involved. So thank you for that call. Thanks. Um, I think now uh, I will open it up to uh, chat questions and surface questions from, um, from the other participants today. And, there are already a couple. So uh, if I could start with the first question that surfaced for, I think, Mike. Um, since youth elections have been held um, as examples at the time of actual elections, maybe we can think of, uh, for example, the program that Civics runs across uh, Canadian high schools. Um, they, there's a, a question or a suggestion that it, they tend to show uh, that young people under 18 would be typically more aligned with green or NDP political agendas. And therefore, what are the chances that uh, a government, um, you know, made up of other parties too, would consider, you know, a supporting lowering the voting age? Thanks. Um, and that's a really critical question. I mean, my view is that young people are, are more politically diverse than we often give them credit for. Uh, and I think I think you can find that in the data. Now, every age cohort has a certain kind of uh, skew or differs from, from, from the others. But in my uh, view and research and experience, young people are politically diverse. Uh, having said that, I, I can share, having had conversations with uh, members from all parties on this issue, and that's the way you know, we work, uh, that there are some who have had a very, very strong reaction and, and even describe this as an existential threat. Uh, so I, I don't I don't think that's credible, but it's a it's a problem. It's a problem in particular because when we're doing democratic reform, ideally you don't want to do that. You don't want that to take on partisan 
dimensions. It, it sounds like the experience in, in Wales was not that, and that's that's really useful because anytime you're you're altering the parameters or changing how an election works, you want to have a a reasonable measure of consensus. I think that's why it's it's good as Senator Senator McFedrin said that this that um, this conversation is st starting in the Senate, which is uh, nonpartisan ish, and uh, and that's a, a good place for it. So it doesn't immediately take on it get you know painted with those partisan colors which makes the conversation very difficult uh but in general I, you know i i think anyone who wants to campaign on this issue should be really focusing on developing support and buy-in um from those political corners who might see this as a threat and may, maybe who are exaggerating the extent to which this is a threat thank you Mike. yeah yeah lisa may i jump in Please. really quickly i just want to build on mike's point by letting folks know <clears throat> that a good part of this summer, um, I've had a summer team with me, working with me, and we've really been focusing on reaching out to individual parliamentarians. So we've set up telephone call after telephone call across the political spectrum, mostly with members of parliament at this point, trying to think ahead to the positioning of this bill once we get it through the Senate, which, which I truly believe we will. To Mike's point now, 70% of the senators are independent. Nobody can tell us how to vote. So this is, a, this is a moment that we've never had before. And in those conversations this summer, exactly as Mike said, there's some very strong reactions. And yes, it's true, it's mostly been from conservatives, but not only from conservatives, but they didn't know the research. In the last 10 years, since the last attempt was made to make this change in Canadian law, there's been amazing research. You know, Austria has had 16 year olds voting for more than 13 years now. So we have data that's never been available before that really strongly supports this positioning of 16 as the, as the new voting age. And to that whole thing about how their parents tell them or what their friends tell them, well, um, Maisie may be able to tell us more about this, but in the Scottish research, what, what we see is that more than 40% of the young people who were getting to vote for the first time indicated that they were not going to vote the same way as their parents. So I, I really think that what we have here is a precious moment um, where we've got really positive forces that are coming together to open up this opportunity. Thank you. I'm glad uh, you raised that last point. I see in the chat, there's some interest in the question about, um, you know, might young people be uh, influenced or might they be uninterested in, in voting? And, uh, you know, I recall when UNICEF was putting together a brief for the electoral reform review in Parliament in 2016, uh, you know, we prepared by thinking of all the possible objections to lower the voting age. And then, realize that for each one, um, you know, these are arguments that um, you could equally level against adults, you know, in terms of being influenced in their vote or not having sufficient information. And um, why would we maybe unfairly apply those to young people? So um, Maisie, do you want to say anything about the experience in Wales uh, uh, around that? I'd just like to say the question asked about um, that sort of scepticism of people wondering whether young people would follow in their parents' footpaths. And um, I find that view quite comical, actually, um, to think that people would assume that of young people. Um, surely you'd think that teenagers would rebel against their parents, no? That's often a common um, conception. And so I think that is also, it's, it, it should encourage political parties to engage with young people themselves. And for politicians who are against votes at 16, I often wonder whether it's because they think they'll lose an election. And I often wonder whether, you know, that's just them saying it because they're scared. Um, and so I think votes at 16, it's an opportunity for political parties to really engage with um, with those votes, um, to engage with young people and encourage them to vote for them. And so I don't think that that is a valid um, argument, actually, that young people would follow in their parents' foot, footsteps. Thanks. Uh, I think we have time for another question, uh, why we, a last question, and it's difficult to choose. I'm interested in the comments about... Um, 
young people, you know, not always participating in politics when they have a chance. I do wonder if that's a chicken and egg because they don't feel listened to when they do. But what I think I want to end with is um, a question about, because this is a panel about politics and um, a possible Mm, you know, path towards electoral reform that may not uh, depend on, on a court challenge or may be complemented by that court challenge. But there was a question about how knowledgeable is the general public about arguments in favor of lowering the voting age. And I wonder how important in an issue like this, broad public support would have to be to tip us into a lower voting age. I, I do recall that Elections Canada this year surveyed uh, candidates in the last federal election that ran for a federal parliament and almost half supported lowering the voting age. So, um, you know, anybody on the panel, do you have any thoughts about, about the importance yeah. of public support or are there other ways to get this done? I just want to jump in with a, with a first quick response on this to say that I've been able to do a number of talk shows um, which are a good way, I think, to gauge the general reaction. And um, in each situation, the hosts were not keen on this idea, but they, they were parading out all the old tropes, all of the old arguments. So it was really great because every time they said blah, 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 I could counter it with research. And the feedback I got was that the, the phone lines lit up. So it may be that they're not that well informed generally right now, but I think the interest is there. Um, and the more evidence, the more factual information we can be sharing, and this is one of the reasons why the youth mobilizers that are working with me are incredibly well informed and able to counter a lot of these stereotypes. The other practical point I wanna make about this is that lowering the voting age to 16 is actually official party policy, yes, of the NDP. But a lot of people don't know that it's on the books as official party policy of the Liberals as well. Thank you very much. Can I come in on this question? Please, Maisie. Um, so in, in Wales, we actually found that the public weren't knowledgeable, um, simply. They didn't quite um, understand because it had never really been talked about or not talked about at, at a high level as such. And so an important thing is education. Um, we talk about education within schools, but it's also education for older generations. We need to be campaigning on social media. We need to be using those sorts of platforms to engage with the general public. And Senator, um, I'm sure you've got a great platform. And so it's the role of people like you. I guess it's your duty um, to inform people of, of this conversation and to raise its profile because ultimately um, there's power in numbers. And the more people that you get on board, the better the more knowledgeable people you get on board, the better. Thank you. And Mike, do you have any final words? Sure, just to say, you know, it's been a couple of years since I've seen a uh, public opinion survey on this. Last time I did, there was a fairly significant opposition to the idea, and yet the idea keeps coming up. My sense is that there's a real divide between quite politically engaged people and not as politically engaged people on this question. I think it's an unfamiliar idea still. Certainly people don't, aren't you know, familiar with the research, why, why would they be? Um, and I think, I think when it's presented, it, um, people react negatively, but there's an opportunity to, to share some of that evidence, uh, have conversations across the country, and also deliver proof of concept. You know, I'm, I'm, I often think about some young people I met a couple of years ago at an event who have been campaigning in their community um, and in the province to lower the voting age uh, and the age in which you can serve in school board trustee elections. Such a simple thing. It's so, it makes so much sense. It's so smart strategically. Uh, it's one thing to try to you know, share the, the research on, on cognitive maturity is another thing to put a, a concrete example in, people's, uh, in front of people and say, look how well this is working. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, greatly appreciated. And of course, you can continue to offer your comments um, to the next panel. And I'm going to, on that note, turn it over to Sharif. Thank you, everyone. I think I'll um, take it here unless you have um, something oh, I'm you sorry. to add here, Sharif. That was my um, miscue to Margie. No worries sorry. at all. Thanks, Margie. Um, 
So I'm Margie, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm on the staff at the Society for Children and Youth of BC. Um, and I'm just gonna be moderating our youth panel. So I'll invite um, Maisie and Katie and Camille to turn your video on now, if you'd like to. Um, a little bit about me, I've been involved in um, work for children and youth rights since I was about nine. <laughs> um, I got pretty frustrated in school and um, petitioned for some changes around grade four and just kind of has snowballed from there for me. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today with Maisie, Katie and Camille. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about them and then they'll each have um, a little time to speak about We've been doing a series of youth engagements uh, around the topic of lowering the voting age that Camille and KD can speak to and Maisie can speak to um, her experiences in Scotland. So Katie, I thought maybe we'll start with you and KD is a network facilitator for the Students Commission of Canada. Um, they grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario and they've worked with local and provincial organizations to help improve the quality of life of vulnerable youth in his community They've always strived to ensure policy and decision makers properly engage with the young demographics of their communities and that they have a vital role in decisions that affect them. Um, Katie, do you want to share with us about um, what you've seen in the engagements the Students Commission have done? Yes, definitely. So um, <laughs> in March of this year, uh, we had we hosted our annual Canada We Want conference with the Students Commission. Um, and we had over 150 youth and adult delegates from all over the country representing all the provinces and territories. Um, and during one of our engagements, during one of our group panel sessions, we actually had um, an opportunity to discuss with our youth delegates there um, what they thought about uh, the youth, uh, youth right to vote and lowering the voting age to 16. Um, and through our discussions, we found out that the majority of youth really do care um, about the elections and truly considered during election time um, the parties that they would vote for and who they would choose. Um, and a lot of the pros around that consisted of um, youth being able to be directly involved in um, decision making around them as well as what affects them now and continuing on to decisions that affect them into the future. We talked about as well um, cons that can come up through conversations. And one of the main cons that was kind of discussed through all the groups was that the idea of youth being influenced um, by older voters, by their peers, by their family members, et cetera. However, we found that through talking with those youth um, and through further engagements during that day, we learned that only, like, the majority of the youth, about 32 to 20, actually um, felt that they would vote outside of their caregiver or their family or their immediate relatives. So it's interesting that we talked about that point earlier on being the question that youth being influenced by their parents and voting the way they did. However, um, even with these engagement sessions that we see that youth are already, majority of youth don't want to vote with their parents and are making their own decisions and thinking about that. When we talked about with the youth about what, um, what important topics, topics that they liked, and what like issues that were very important to them across all groups. They all mentioned climate change, education, economics, and housing. And then there was a strong focus in a lot of the groups around truth leading to reconciliation and making sure that we improve the quality of life for indigenous populations, especially youth. When the idea of when we, when we started focusing more on the idea of the actual voting age, um, the vast majority of groups, about six out of our nine groups, all, all said that they believe the voting age should be lowered to 16, if not lower. And when, we, when the youth finally did have a chance, we, we actually held a vote um, at the end of this engagement session, and 76.6% of our youth voted yes to lowering the voting age, 18.1% of youth voted no, and we had 5.3% who did not vote at all. So it shows that a vast majority of youth are very engaged, care about the issues, are passionate about certain issues, and want to have a chance to speak on these issues in government and policy and want their voice heard. And it falls in line with the UN's um, Convention on the Rights of the Child in Article 12 that clearly states that youth should have um, voice in decisions that affect them. 
amazing. Thanks, Katie. Um, next, I wanted to invite um, Camille to share a bit about um, his experience. Camille's been involved in leadership and advocacy work for many years. In recent years, he's served as the co-founder, president, and chairman of the Board of Calgary's Youth Community Council and chairman of his school's Student Senate. He also sits as student co-chair of his school's Diversity and Equity Committee, a senior executive on his school's Student Voice Club, and vice president of his school's Interact Club. Um, and um, Camille is also one of nine young people from across the country that sit on the Children's First Canada Youth Advisory Council. Thanks so much. Um, and just uh, to go back to some of the work um, that Children First Canada has done in terms of the youth age consultations, uh, from March to April, uh, Children First um, led a consultation partnership with um, Wisdom to Action and Youth Central um, to other uh, advocacy organizations um, across the country. Um, in which we held virtual sessions um, that brought you together from across the country to sort of analyze the perspective on, you know, what, 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 what do you feel about lowering the voting age? And more than 70% of surveyed youth, both across virtual sessions and a survey that was sent out to youth across the country, um, said that they are in favor of casting a ballot at the age of 16. More than 70%. That is a huge majority. Um, and the fact that it hasn't been done by now is kind of uh, astounding. Um, more in terms of like the statistics was that um, throughout that throughout those surveys and those consultations, we also recognized that um, view, that eighty eight percent of youth um, said that they had thought about who they would vote at uh, who they would vote for um, in the last federal election, which I think is really telling. Um, eighty eight percent of youth um, knowing who they want to vote for, and eighty eight percent of youth um, could shape the future of our nation. Uh, and the report also noted that 63% of young people felt that politicians would pay more attention to the issues that youth care about if they have the right to vote. And as we know, that's a pretty clear reality right now because youth don't have the ability to select their leaders. Change makers often don't think it's necessary to take into consideration the perspectives of young people. And because of that, not a lot of change is made. Um, an interesting fact that I discovered was that um, on the Prime Minister's Youth Council, the council is composed of people from the ages of 16 to 24. So the fact that 16 year olds are able to advise the highest ranked policymaker um, in the country and yet don't have the ability to select policymakers um, is something that I find uh, quite uh, astounding, <laughs> to say the least. Thanks, Camille. Um, and I'll just share briefly a bit about um, SCY also held a consultation on the voting age um, virtually for young people in BC. And we're planning to hopefully do another. So if there's any young people from BC on the call, feel free to be in touch with me if you'd like to join that. Um, and we found our results were very similar to what Katie and Camille both shared. Lots of young people that joined were uh, very supportive of this idea. A lot of them honestly hadn't um, had the idea posed much before and so hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about it, um, but quickly uh, felt like, you know, it made sense um, to them. So we do see a fair amount of support. Um, and then Maisie, I wanted to invite you to share about kind of what the experience has been like um, for you in a country that has um, gone through with a lower voting age. Um, yeah, so hi guys, it's a pleasure to be here. I apologise in advance um, for my accent. I forgot to mention that on the last panel. If you can't understand me, I am terribly sorry. Um, so I'm 16 years old um, and I've recently been granted the right to vote in Welsh elections. So I feel very honoured. Um, I do feel very lucky to be able to do that now in Wales. Um, I'm a member of Wales' Welsh Youth Parliament. So we actually have a youth parliament um, a national youth parliament in Wales uh, made up of 60 young people from across the country um, who represent young people's voices. We were democratically elected through an online election, um, a very successful online election I would say, and we work on priority issues in our two-year term. I'm coming actually to the end of my term, the end of my term is November this year so it's quite a quite a sad time for us um, <laughs> but it's been a, a pleasure to work with them over the last um, 18 months or so. Our priorities are mental health and well-being, 
or mental health support, I should say, um, life skills in the curriculum, and then littering and plastic waste. And a big part of that life skills um, topic is political education. So it's something that I've always felt very, very strongly about. And it's actually how I got into discussing Votes at 16. Um, it was through a steering group um, on um, political education that I became involved with the movement of Votes at 16. And so, yeah, in Wales, it's come into place now. Um, it is law that 16 and 17 year olds are allowed to vote in Welsh elections. And like I said in the previous panel, it was a long and tiring process. But advice for young people in Canada, I would say, is to be persistent. Um, it, it does seem annoying. Your senators may get quite annoyed, um, but laugh about it. <laughs> it's their duty to listen to you, so make sure they hear your voice. Thanks so much, Maisie. Um, so we'll open it up to any questions um, from the chat in just a minute. But before we do that, I wanted to give you each a chance to say, do you have any advice for other young people who um, might be talking to their peers and hearing um, disagreement from their peers? And how do you talk to other young people who don't feel that they are ready for or want the right to vote right now? And advice for how to have those conversations, if any of you have it. I'll start if you'd like. Um, once again, be persistent, be confident in your opinion. Um, if, if you really want votes at 16, you need to tell everybody that. Don't be afraid to be the odd one out in a friendship group. I know not many of my friends are very politically engaged, but they know I am and they respect that. And that's really important amongst friends is that they respect you. And if they don't, why are you friends? <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, try and encourage them to use their voice because they deserve it. We've mentioned Article 12 of the UNCRC a few times. Um, you know, make sure they're aware of that right and make sure they use it. Yeah, I think building off of Macy's point a little bit is to be knowledgeable, right? Every time, whenever you go into an argument or a discussion or a debate, there's nobody will listen if you are yelling screaming and shouting um know your facts know the movement and know um what's been happening around the world uh, to make this movement a reality in other countries and how we can localize that uh, within our country and so i think that's probably the biggest advice that you can go to um, in terms of uh, motivating the younger population uh, to vote 16. <laughs> yeah and also just to add on to all the points made so far is just that a lot of times when government and policymakers have engaged with youth and a lot of times it's often used in a sense of tokenization and oftentimes those youth are only used as a check mark on a box saying they've engaged youth and things like that when talking about lowering the voting age to 16 this is a chance to use voice to truly actually affect change and that is a really big selling point in conversations and in discussions and debates around lowering the voting age with um Lowering the voting age to 16, because a lot of a lot of the youth who do necessarily not understand, like have the sort of animosity towards it, or is because of the fact they already are hesitant about government bodies. Um, I think it was mentioned in the chat earlier um, that Apathy is born released um, some research around the around the fact that more youth are politically involved in like not like non-traditional political streams like protests and activism and things like that because a lot of times you feel that's be that's a better use of their time so they can fully have their voice heard by lowering the voting age to 16 we can allow for the formal setting and formal government and policy for you to be heard the youth voice to be heard on that level yeah if i could yeah, just build on katie's if i could yeah yeah um i think i think that's totally uh, correct. I think often young people uh, don't engage in, you know, some of those more traditional forms of political communication, such as letter writing or phone calls or um, some of those, those more traditional streams because politicians don't listen. So what's the point, right? Like that's, that's, that's one of the biggest issues and that's blunt, but it's the truth. Uh, and so, you know, if we take a look at movements like Black Lives Matter, if we take a look at climate change, right, the climate change marches that have been had, if we take a look at Me Too, all of these have been um, movements taken up by younger people. It's been younger people going to the streets and making sure they are seen and heard loud and clear. <laughs> and so that's that's probably the biggest story that we will engage young people is as soon as this, um, well, the more uh, momentum this movement gains and the more 
people hear about it and the more people understand the value of it, the more people will take to the streets and the more noise that will be generated around this and the more uh, pressure really that'll be put on politicians to listen to young people and to change the voting age because that's the only way young people will ever get their voices heard. And that's, that's, that's a fact. <laughs> Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, so we have a question for Maisie specifically, which is, um, have you noticed a difference in how politicians engage on issues important to young people now that they can vote? Um, and then also a question kind of more broadly that anyone could speak to is that um, the word teenager didn't appear once across the major political party platforms in last year's elections in Canada. Um, and so someone's wondering how would giving 16 year olds the vote change the amount of attention this age group receives from politicians? I'll begin by answering the question then on um, how politicians have started to engage with us. And I don't think they quite realise how much of a say we're going to have in the next election. Um, I wouldn't say that their engagement has changed enough yet. Um, we've actually got an election in May 2021 in Wales and so that that month I'm sure politicians will soon realize that they need to engage with us in a much more effective way um, and you know earlier we mentioned that young people don't do the traditional you know writing letters phone calling um, and so I think politicians in Wales need to take that on board and need to take to social media some of them do a fantastic job and I have seen that they're trying to be more child friendly as such um, but I wouldn't say that enough of them have realised what kind of say we're going to have. And Do I'll, I'll add on to the next question if you'd like. Um, yeah. Um, well, I've actually seen a question in the chat about how we could mobilise young people, um, how in Canada you could mobilise the young people. And I think it goes back to that thing of raising awareness, making sure that people are knowledgeable um, and raising the question, you know, make it a topic of conversation, put it, try and get it in the media, write some articles. I, I've written articles for pretty big names in Wales, um, all around votes of 16, go into schools, you know, um, Canada's One Youth, is it UNICEF's One Youth Canada? Um, go out there, get out there, make sure that young people know who you are, they know what you're campaigning for, because it's important that you make that noise, um, that initial noise. Katie or Camille, do you have anything you'd like to add on how you think um, the way politicians engage with young people might change or on um, how organizations can mobilize young people to support the lowering the voting age. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think engagement um, with young people um, when the voting age has changed uh, will have to change, right? It, it will have to. Like we will, we will, we will officially be a group that defines um, which party um, is put into power or which party um, has the most ability to affect change. Uh, and so, you know, if if a party really wants to uh, you know, be those leading change makers in the country, then they'll need to listen to what the issues, um, what the issues are that are affecting young people the most, right? Climate change will have to be taken seriously. Uh, Black Lives Matter will have to be taken even more seriously, right? All of these um, issues that have really come to light um, in recent years um, amongst our generation will really be brought to the forefront of conversation uh, and will really be one of the uh, most uh, effective ways uh, to initiate the change that young people want to see across the country. Yeah, and to add on to that, um, by like people, what government and like policy decision makers don't often realize is that even though you don't have necessarily the right to vote right now, um, we are still constituents. And by lowering that voting age to 16, I think it'll allow. Um, government and policymakers to finally actually see youth as constituents of people who have a voice and can affect whether or not they get elected and can affect whether or not um, their party stays in power and what policy and decision making and decision making tools happen. And I think it'll be great to see youth voice and youth action finally start to take, be taken seriously. And on to the point of mobilize, um, organizations mobilizing youth to talk about that. Um, we have to, as organizations and systems and institutions, understand that youth function a little differently. 
and that we have to meet them on their level when having these conversations. We have to outreach with them. We have to be on the ground and we have to be working with them. We have to get our head spaces out of these traditional formal mindsets of how policy and how decision has to work and listen to the voices, the ideas they have because they have some amazing ideas as to how we can shift the way we decide things so we can shift the way policy is created. We, the way our institutions work now, don't even target the like most vulnerable and marginalized people in our community, even here in Canada as a developed nation. Um, not just youth, but for people across the board. And when we start to meet people on that level, we can truly understand the issues that affect the marginalized groups and all groups within Canada and truly have a way to create a better community and a better country for all. Uh, if I could just add on to that as well. <laughs> um, in, in addition to that, I think it's also very important for um, politicians that do support the movement to become allies, right? For people, for politicians, and people in general who really want to see this uh, movement gain traction and who want to see this uh, pull through, they need to support young people in every way they can in getting this bill passed. For example, um, I, saw, I saw a comment in the chat earlier um, about the NDP uh, being very supportive of that. Um, getting, uh, pro helping young people get the prominent professionals they need and the prominent leaders they need to advocate for this um, at the parliament level and outreach to the public um, is one of the, other most effective ways that will not only get young people on board, but will also get sort of that adult majority on board with it as well. That's great. Thank you all. Um, and I think it's important too to see representation, right? And so in a political party, we want to see young people that are involved and that are part of who's trying to mobilize young people and not just kind of older adults inviting a few token teenagers in, but really seeing a lot of young people and young adults um, leading the way is awesome. Um, so we do have another question um, for you, Maisie, which is about, um, in Wales, have you seen more young people becoming interested in voting now that they have been included? We definitely have in Wales. Um, amongst my friendship group alone, like I mentioned earlier, not many of them are politically engaged, but since this law came into place that folks at 16 were, um, were allowed, um, it's raised awareness of devolution because obviously Wales is part of the United Kingdom and there are two separate parliaments um, in the UK and in Wales. So it's definitely raised the profile of our Welsh government um, and it's also raised raise that sort of thought I guess of having a say I guess people don't really think about it until they turn 18 until they start to spend a lot of money on the government when they may not want to or their money might get spent on the wrong things um, and so it's definitely um, helped to engage young people um, but like I said earlier in Wales there was a drive for this all along um, a lot of young people were very passionate all along and so those people have remained passionate um, but I'd say that definitely there's been increased engagement since since they've been given the right. Thanks Maisie and there's a question about where would you suggest that we find young people to discuss policy um, and concern about um, you know representatives of political parties maybe aren't able to come speak at schools um, because they're seen as partisan so sort of where would we recommend um, finding us? <laughs> Um, I'll start on this. So you mentioned how it might be a bit too partisan um, and we talked about this earlier about how it is a, a cross party um, thing. A lot of parties in your Canadian Senate apparently um, are four votes at 16 and that is crucial. Um, I think it's it's the job of those parties to come together and to go into schools together. I know that in Wales, um, schools will allow politicians to visit. They may ask to remain politically neutral or apolitical. Um, obviously, it is down to the politician in the moment, and sometimes they don't listen, as I'm sure we all know. Um, <laughs> but yeah i think it's important to encourage those parties to work together in this because it's not it's not a political issue it, it's um it's a democratic issue absolutely and i think um like another really uh, great way to find find uh, young people who are interested in discussing these policy issues is to reach out to the various organizations across the country 
uh, that have young people involved and that are sort of advocating for this movement. If we even take a look at the organizations that have put this webinar together today, right? The Students Commission, uh, Children's First Canada, uh, UNICEF, right? There are so many organizations here that have a repertoire of young people who are interested to push for this change and to um, make this movement a reality um, that we will find them, we have them, uh, um, and it, it will be able to um, be made a reality. I also think um, putting a call out to the community, right? Putting a call out saying that we're interested uh, in looking for young people who want to discuss this very important policy decision and who want to have a voice at the table for this very important policy uh, discussion is another really amazing way that you'll be able to find those young people. I think um, just to add on, it's important that you reach out to individual senators too. We've um, had Senator McFedron on here today and people, um, people of that profile have got a platform to, um, to encourage young people to, to get involved in this discussion. And so as an individual who feels extremely passionate, you should be trying to sort of reach out to those senators to reach out to more people to make them passionate too. Right. Well, we are just about coming to the end of our um, time for today. I'll pass it back over to Sharif in just a moment, um, but just wanted to give a moment for any of our panelists to have a, a final parting thing they want to say or share or piece of advice they'd like to give to our attendees um, before we wrap it up. Some advice is to not give up. If you really want to see Votes at 16 come into place, then show that passion, display it, show it off to the world and um, make a noise. And I, I, I promise you that you'll get what you want in the end because that pressure will, it, it'll mound up and they'll have no choice but to listen. And thank you for allowing me to be here today. Yeah. and um on the topic of when it comes to engaging youth, like I just really want to amplify the point of like meeting youth at their level. And when it comes to adult ally partnerships and when it comes to partnering with youth, it isn't an adult leading a conversation with a bunch of youth. It's youth and adults sharing the same, like sh having shared responsibility in the decision making and in the advocacy work that needs to happen around vote 16. And then pushing that drive forward and also adults knowing when to take a back seat and knowing how to properly amplify the voices of youth. Absolutely. And I would say um, probably my parting advice or thought is that don't underestimate young people. Young people are powerful. We are strong. We are resilient. It, th this year has proven that uh, and that um, this is a movement and it'll take time, but we will we will we will make it a reality because that's what young people do. We ignite the fire to create change. Thank you all so much, Maisie, Katie, and Camille for being here with us today and all your great wisdom <laughs> shared. And I will pass it over to Sharif to close us out. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just so, I'm beaming. I'm just so blown away by how this has gone. Can, if we were in person, I would just do a big round of applause. Uh, for everyone who has uh, who has uh, contributed today, and especially that ending on that note of the youth panel has felt uh, is just re inspired me personally to keep keep at this this process and this journey. So thank you very much to everyone who has participated. So um, we want to uh, we want to thank all of those of the folks who attended as well today. Um, it's been recorded as well, so we're going to share this out with you. If uh, I know some of some people came and went because it's you know it's it's we're in busy busy times, this will be emailed out and shared with folks. Uh, we want to remind that for any uh, folks who are youth who are under the age of twenty, uh, there will be a, a webinar in about thirty minutes time. Uh, where we will have a follow-up discussion if there's any interest in pursuing advocacy uh, for lowering the voting age. So to the question about, uh, you know, where to go and which organizations, uh, representatives from the various organizations that are supporting young people in this journey uh, will be there in 30 minutes to chat through 
uh, what, uh, you know, what, what advocacy might look like for lowering the voting age. So if you're interested, uh, the information is up on the screen now, but you won't have the screen forever. So you might want to take, you might want to take a screenshot, but don't worry. Uh, it's also in the email that was sent out to you as part of the registration. Um, so we will, uh, we will all connect back with you uh, in 30 minutes. Uh, thank you again to all the panelists, to all of you for being here today. Uh, and we look forward to working with all of you in the future to, uh, in, the, in the work to lower the voting age. Take care, everybody.